now. I'm, I'm here in titles for the sessions. Who is so creative? And this is a little bit about that. I'm introducing disruptive innovation and creative, creative destruction. So all over to you, and thank you again for being here with us. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be for the first time in the forum. Uh, today I will talk to you about disruptive innovation and creative destruction with a focus at the end on medicine because this is my background. Um, I will start saying that the, the times that we are living today are very turbulent. If you watch the news today, there are mass shootings, there are wars, there are deadly incurable diseases, cancers, environmental destruction, mistrusting politicians, fake news, and social frustration for every problem that is keeping us behind. Our failure to appreciate the value of alliances among countries, the value of collaboration, to create novel ideas, to join forces, to join our voices so that we can solve big problems, as well as our occasional disparagement of the value of knowledge and the value of education, is actually self-defeating. Uh, some of you may argue today that we should be disappointed, or we should be scared or angry. And some of you might say that, why should we bother, right? We are in the elite of the world. Every single person who is here today is one of the privileged few. So my talk today is not about the unspeakable tragedies of the world and all the problems that we're facing. It's about seeing the bigger picture of how constructive, positive change is made of how we can manufacture opportunities, of how we can create disruptive innovation, and what type of creative destruction can lead to a better future for all of us. And this can only happen if we are inclusive. So the top 10 problems, and this is the last time that I'm gonna talk about the problems of the world, as you can see, as they have been voted by the youth in Europe, are ranging from cancer to wars and human ignorance even. This creates something of a challenge for us, but we're not so naive as to think that there wouldn't be bumps along the way to progress. Some of those will be big bumps. There would be wars, disasters, economic meltdowns. And I'm coming from a country like Greece that has a major economic crisis and most people from the youth are feeling hopeless. The concept of growth may seem far off, especially in places like the ones that I'm coming from. But progress, no matter how small, continues through the good times and through the bad times. So the question is now, should we really waste our time working on innovation? These challenges are really big for most of the small countries that we're coming from, and why shouldn't we just focus on philanthropy? Why shouldn't we change our priorities? Why should we invest in science like regenerative medicine, creating artificial organs, or space exploration when people are dying and there is you know, immense poverty in the world? So does it make sense to invest these billions? And I would say that the short answer is yes. It makes sense. The very long days of isolation are behind us. Pandemics do not respect borders. Terrorists operate in a global scale, and overpopulation is everybody's problem. So disruptive innovation, this is the main focus of my talk, and I would say that it creates a new reality. It's a reality that no country, no matter how rich or poor, can escape. So we are at the very early stages of tremendous exponential technological progress, which is realized at a fast pace. And this seemed inconceivable just a few decades ago. And I don't know if you can see, but in the lines, the colored lines, there are the names of some fields that perhaps some of you have heard. It's 3D printing, it's nanotechnology, it's artificial intelligence, <coughs> It is regenerative medicine. It is renewable uh, energy. And all these fields, they haven't been around and their applications haven't been around for too long. The merger of these fields set off a cascade of innovations, producing not only new products, but also new management styles 
and new, a new reality. How we manufacture, how we control our environment, and how we distribute, we use, and how we recycle our materials is critical. When the world around us becomes plugged in, plugged into the internet and the World Wide Web, and effectively becomes self-aware, then it will drive inefficiencies like never before. And in this sense, we believe that in a hyperlink uh, world where everybody is connected and everybody can share his voice and his opinion and his new novel ideas, solving problems anywhere means that we can solve problems everywhere. Now it might seem like a very optimistic approach, but let's see why we say that. How can we innovate? How can this happen? Well, the main tool, the greatest tool, is the human brain. You would think that is very simplistic to think about it. But the way that innovation started was just by using individual's power, the brain power of an individual. The years went by, and we have collaborative brain power. People started living together in communities and cities. The, the internet became a reality. So suddenly, we have artificial intelligence, and we can we can implement and exploit the humanity's great power. The future might hold that we can couple artificial intelligence and the humanity's great power as a whole. Can you imagine of having 7.6 billion online debating, sharing, and creating new developments, novel Facebooks, like a, go a novel Google or novel Apple products? This will change completely the reality that we have as it is today. So what is disruptive innovation? Innovation, I would say, it's not just an invention or an algorithm, or it's not just a scientific laboratorial experiment. It is the way that we are changing the world. So can you imagine? using a single sample of stem cells, like the cryoviolet that you see on the left corner of this page, and being able to tissue engineer to create 20,000 tons of meat. Well, this can happen today. It is not a sci-fi experiment. We can do this today in the lab. And on the left corner, you can see something that some of you might recognize, and this is a bug, basically, that we can re-engineer in the lab, and it can be used in extreme environments, and even we can send a small vial of this to Mars and create a new space colony. What happens with them is that they are sensing the environmental cues, and they're producing cement, the bug. So the more we culture them, the more plastic we can create, the more cement we can create, and we can create whole building blocks from it. So the day after tomorrow, what happens after the big exponential technologies erase come to, to, to life and come to practice where they are approachable to everyone? Well, a very good example is the information technology because everybody's using it today. It started with the old web, where we had, we, be, we began with just simple search engines and e-commerce and social networks like messengers. And then we moved on to mobile and the internet of things, where this is what we have today, is mobile applications and smart wearables. And we are thinking of what is coming next into our future. And a lot of us believe that this will be the internet of beings. And this is a combination of a biological digital uh, footprint. What could that be? This could be that each and every one of you could have your gene characterized and identified. You could have all of your diseases or potential precursor disease that will come in the future in a database. This could mean that you can have enhancers like implants, brain implants, or enhancers for memory, for example, or for, for sense, and like having biosensors, or having smart wearables that even today they start to be 
applied in many different uh, sectors. So in this digital innovation world, is this under threat though today? And I'm asking this because this, all of these applications that we are, we are scientists are envisioning, they are wonderful as they are if we're thinking of their po positive applications, but they come with a price. And the era of the open web and its open source cu cultures are, are under a question, also by the scientific community. Discussing this digital innovation doesn't completely make sense. And I'm sure many of you are concerned about our privacy, for example. So we will discuss a little bit about these concepts in the, in the following sessions. But I, before that, I would like to introduce to you creative destruction. Many of you might be thinking, what, what is creative destruction? This is so, such a paradox. Um, so creative destruction is trying basically to capture a very simple idea. It is innovation that is transforming the economy and society. How does this happen? Well, the problem with this concept is that it explains things after they have happened. And it does not offer an analytic way of why these disruptive behaviors happen within the marketplace and within society. As you see in the pictures, you probably recognize, most of you here because we're older, a lot of the instruments that the, the guy on the left side is having. He has walkie-talkies and a fax machine and you know old monitors. All of these things do not exist anymore. They are completely out of, of, of the market. And today, all of these devices that you can see laid in front of him and on him, we just have them on our iPhone. It's just in our pocket. Um, and I think a very interesting also example is Henry Ford. As you know, he has created the first car. And he said that if I had asked people, his customers, what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And the past 50 years, especially this field, has been tremendously disrupted. We have not just cars, we have now electric cars from Tesla. We have flying cars that are in prototypes. And a lot of people are thinking, what is the next step from flying cars? Could it be having flying spacecrafts that are also cars? So that we can do parabolic flights and not just flights over the environment of Earth. So this is a question again, for where are the boundaries of this disruptive innovation and how does it affect the economy as well from its country? So markets themselves cannot have an epistemic state because they don't exist as a separate entity, but as processes. So it follows from this that it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to predict what is the next disruptive innovation? What is the field that is going to be completely disrupted? And in my head, I'm also thinking of Amazon as an example, which is a company that started with selling books. And one day they said, oh, maybe we can use drones. And everybody laughed. But today, everybody has a drone. All the kids have a drone. So it is another example of how things are changing really fast. And a very easy example as well is robotics. So after the information field, a paradise shift in productivity especially, in countries that are basing their economy on productivity, is the way that automation and robotics have interwined. And what started as a natural extension of automation 60 years ago has now spawned numerous new vertical markets. So robotics will render labor a far less significant component of overall production costs, which is something that countries like China are basing their economy today. This will allow more expansion and making it completely independent of geolocation. So the manufacturing is not going to be anymore a, a problem. We will be able to 3D print anything, anywhere, one layer at a time, and we will be able to automate with robotic systems anything in much cheaper 
space than before. So robots will enter every aspect of our life. And I'm sure that some of you are recognizing the NASA robot on the left, Sophia robot that is a citizen in this country, in the middle. And you're thinking, well, they're not doing that well. They haven't achieved much, right? If we, if we would grade them, we would say they didn't pass the class. But we don't see all the advancements of this field just yet. I'm working in the bioengineering field, which means can we merge what we know from robotics and the mechanical engineering and also what we know from bioengineering, from stem cell research, and see if these two, when they fuse, if they come closer to a humanity. And many of you would think, oh, this is something we will not experience in our lifetime. Well, let me tell you, the first robotic hand that can sense, that has infused neurons and can sense, can feel, has happened in 2017. It's a reality. It exists in the lab. And there are many different other biohybrid robots that they're using different types of cells from mostly animal sources, from rats, from different in vivo uh, animals, and they are able to have some small, sort of small functionality. It could be by rendering their function, their movements with light, or different type of functions like contractility, for example. But this small progress is indicative for where we can go in the very near future. And also have in your mind that these are exponential technologies. So we may think that 10 years is a short time, but for technology like this, it's really long. So I will focus now on medicine. And it is a field that most people understand the most because at some point in your life, you must have faced some sort of, or your family members must have faced some sort of problems. And I think that I will divide my talk in four pillars for medicine. The first one is preventive medicine. Very few people talk about it. Very few people, especially in policy, I don't know if we have any politicians here today. Very few people in policy talk about it. Because preventive medicine is about creating lifestyle choices and creating laws and regulations that are keeping everybody healthy prior to becoming sick. And this is something that doesn't actually have a, 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 a fast impact when you're regulating something like that to the audience. They don't see a change. The health population stays healthy. It's not that you're curing anyone. So what type of changes will we see on this field? Till today, the only r regulations that we have is healthy eating in preventing medicine, exercise, and healthy habits, even in co-working environments. But the basis of this healthcare model, this pyramid, as we call it, will completely change. As you see, I have put wearable monitoring, wearables, connected devices, and also quantified self-apps. We already use, we already have them, the smart Fitbits, for example. They will allow enormous collection of data, which will contradict with the, the state, the regulatory state of affairs, both in Europe and worldwide, about how can we protect the population from the use of this data? How can this data not be bridged or used in an exploited manner by other sources? So we also have, apart from vital signs, uh, the stress levels and blood, uh, the blood chemistries that could happen at home. Another reality is also the lab on a chip, which is something that will also disrupt the way that we are helping the populations in third world countries. How, we, how fast can we diagnose epidemics that are coming from third world countries and they're spreading in the world? So bear in mind that after only one year of having training in artificial intelligence systems, like the IBM Watson, for example, system, it was successful in, in achieving a diagnosing rate of different type of, for example, MRI examinations 
more than 90%. It meant that having an AI robotic system in the hospital, it could diagnose 90% better than any human the conditions of the patients. That is itself, it's transforming completely the field and saving enormous costs in hospital settings. So rather than on relying, you will see I'm having um, one uh, sketch which says artificial food. And I'm sure most of you are thinking, why would we say something so sci-fi? Well, artificial food is already in place in many, many different laboratories. It has not been approved for generic use. I have, I have tried, I'm, I'm fine, as you see, I think. Um, so what happens is, this is a combination with another notion. At this moment, the preventive medicine regulations are discussing what is the, the healthy uh, foods, food pyramid which is even something that most scientists are not agreeing, even just the basic intakes of the food pyramid. And what we're seeing that was gonna happen in this decade, it's not gonna happen in 50 years, within this decade, we believe that we will have this thing that is called a nutrition monitor. So it will be consisting of a scanning wand and a swallowable sensor. So it's like a small pill that you can take in the morning and it will determine exactly how much you will need to eat, of, how, of what different ingredients you're missing, what different vitamins you need to take. And we also have 3D printers that are 3D printing different types of food, not only meat, but also vegetables and other, other type of food sources. You would think, why would we need that on Earth? We can, we can plant things. Well, not everywhere, right? Not everywhere. And also, you would think that food is available in most places, which is not true. Although we do have abundance of different type of species and animals, the food is not redistributed in the correct way. So there is a big scarcity in many, many regions in the world. And also, there is scarcity in places like other planets. So people like me that are in space exploration having the capability to say that we don't need to find a way to create a cargo so that we can protect food and send it from Earth to Mars, but instead we can send a small vial of stem cells and they can produce tons of meat there. This is a completely paradigm shift in the way that we were thinking the past 100 years. So, the last one is syncardia rhythm. Many of you might not have heard of what that is. So it is our physical activity, but also our mental condition, and it is the way that we are, the sleeping patterns are regulating our physiopathology. And this is something that we believe should be at the core of the preventive medicine regime in the next 10 years, because it will help all the population become healthier. It will also help women become more fertile, which is a very significant factor we're facing the past 10 years with women becoming less infertile because of stresses. And this chrono disruption impacts it, it, the etiology of many different types of, uh, of cardi cardiac, for example, also diseases. So another pillar is the one that I'm mostly working on. It's on artificial organs and tissue engineering. Why would we need artificial organs? We can have real organs, right? Well, today there are more than 120,000 patients that are registered to receive an organ and only 25,000 organs are available. And mind you that there is a very complicated process to create the histocompatibility between which patient is capable of receiving an organ. And you might be thinking, well, still, you know, somebody can wait a little bit in the hospital till he receives a transplant. Can, does anyone know how many years someone needs to wait to receive a kidney, for example, in Europe and in the United States? It's three and a half years, the mean time. The mean time. Which could be five years, right? 
So it is a problem, but also there's another very critical issue that I'm, I'm really, it's very close to my heart. And that is the illegal organ trafficking. And many people think that this happens somewhere far away in third world countries and it never affects us. Well, the crime, the initial crime may be happening in Latin America, it's happening in China, it's happening in Libya, it's happening in many different parts of the world. However, I'm sure all of you have, you know, or you're friends with, or you have an extended family member that has used illegal sources to get an organ. And as a matter of fact, there was, we had a, a survey in all the surgeons and transplant clinics in the United States, and we asked the doctors, how many of you do you think have you completed a surgery without knowing the source of the organ? whether it was legally uh, donated or not. How much do you think said, we don't know, it's probably, we got illegal organs for sure. H how much do you think the percentage is? 10%, 20%? It's 50%, one out of two. It's 50%, yeah. So the artificial organ bioengineering field, yes, it is a very complicated, field that has more disappointments than successes. And there are many, many years that it was built because it's a, a multidisciplinary field. It was a field that you need to know material science, regenerative medicine, biology, surgical sciences as well. And it is extremely complicated to cr take a few stem cells from a patient and find a way to recreate a whole organ. And there are three different routes to do that today. One is by 3D printing, creating a bio-ink from both biomaterials and also stem cells, and trying to build layer by layer the, some parts of the organ, and then trying to rebuild you know, with angiogenesis different parts and hoping that it will have some functionality at the end. The second one is taking scaffolds, as we call them, so taking organs from animals that have very close pathophysiology and anatomy to some of the organs that humans have, and then completely re take off all the biological materials, the nuclear components, and try to infuse human stem cells on the basis of this organ and see if it revives. And of course, there are many different methods by building in the lab hybrid biomaterials and nanocomposite biomaterials. So taking nanoparticles, for example, taking particles that are conductive and putting them in polyurethanes, in types of plastics, in order to create nerves because they need conductivity, then taking neurons, taking different types of stem cells and trying to see if we add a different type of cocktail of different serums and different mixes of oxygen and nitrogen, different types of, of um, conditions and try to mimic as much as possible the natural environment of this uh, very primitive form of organs, will they mature, will they grow? So this is the basis of this field. And as you see, I have put the different techniques in between. And I say that we can use them as transplants, which would be the ideal, it would be a wonder for everyone that is working on this field. But also, we can, we can use the smaller blocks that we do know that they approximate, like the smaller pieces of tissue that we know that we're really close in approximating their functionality and they're really, really close to how the human tissue is, and use these smaller bits to test drugs. Would you think that is important? Many people say, why, would that is, why is that so critical? Well, it is, first of all, because we are using animals to do that. And no scientist that I know of is happy doing in vivo animal research. It's very heartbreaking. But we have to, because we have to make sure that the safety and the efficacy of the drugs are right for, for people. And this will completely disrupt 
the way that pharmaceuticals are working as well, the way that universities are working, science will become cheaper. So the next field is precision medicine and nanobiotechnology, which is also what I've, I've studied. So the goal of these two fields is to create a transformational leap and to enable more accurate diagnosis. When we say precision medicine is instead of, is having this concept of instead of cutting away a whole forest, making sure that if there is one tree that is creating a problem, taking that tree out. That's the concept. And precision medicine aspires to improve the health outcomes quickly and broadly and also have a, a emerging effect with collaborative fields and that is also the big data and epigenetics. So the patients of the future will have ubiquitous monitoring and early detection of anomalies and cancer, cancers and this could be with the use of biobots for example and the use of nanocarriers that were, are going to circulate within the bloodstream. So what we were thinking that is possible is to create something really, really small that can be injected into the blood and that it could have attached particular drugs that could only target the cancer cells instead of the healthy ones. So precision medicine will be layering different kinds of biological, environmental, behavioral, and epigenetic data for individuals. And then computationally identify what are the disease links. And it's also an interesting point to point out that the cost of a genome sequencing, many of you might have heard about it the past few years, is, has plummeted 100,000 times fold. So from 100 million, which was the case a few years back in 2001, it is now $1,000, from 100 million to $1,000. So this, is, this shows the potential of this field, that it can be accessible, it can be affordable. So the final one is gene editing. This is something that some of you may have heard the past maybe five years. It has been ongoing in the labs, but I, I think that the lay public have heard of it fairly recently. So the development of genome editing technology is revolutionizing the study of the genes, how they function, and the potential of a new class of therapeutics. So here you can see the three technologies that are transforming the way that we can edit particular genes that, are, that have an anomaly and remove them and then incorporate other ones that are healthy. So this has not been possible five years ago. And right now, there are clinical trials even in embryos in order to be able to, to remove genes that have some sort of anomalies. Ideally, we hope that this could even be implemented in cases of Down syndrome, in cases of anomalies that we could even foresee during the pregnancy, removing some stem cells, re-engineer them in the, in the lab, and transplant them back in the, in the uh, fetus, and then see whether it is born as a healthy child. This as you understand, it will change completely the way that the medical doctors are working today and the way that we understand medicine as a whole, as a field. So I'm sure many of you are thinking it is good to think of all the disruptive innovations only in their positive light. But there are a lot of bioethics and biopolitics around innovation. The future of healthcare holds unprecedented opportunity for sure for both the younger generation and even for us because of its fast pace. But it is high time we leave the isolation days behind us and that we try to synergistically regulate ahead of innovation and not behind. It's time also to think what are the possible side effects for example, what are the worst case scenarios? How can we prevent wearable devices from being hacked? In an era of augmented reality, for example, 
we can have, even today, augmented reality contact lenses. How can we prevent ubiquitous information and big data to be, from being pervasive and being defended or, or used by other uh, author authorities? And what is the framework that we will put in place to prevent negative side effects? For example, if in the future patient Google their symptoms, they scan themselves, they are doing a blood test at home or they're doing a lab, a lab on a chip, for example, uh, application, and they have a, their own diagnosis at their own stake without wanting to even consult a doctor, a professional. How do we prepare society for a time when financial differences between population could lead to biological differences? When the elitistic minority can augment, for example, their human capabilities, they can edit their genes, they can cure their kids, but then the poor people cannot. How can we prevent uh, biobots from controlling not only our health by being in our bloodstream, for example, but also our lives from being used as a weapon, for example, instead of as a therapeutic tool? And will this cascade of innovations create a paradigm shift in our philosophical I'm sorry, direction of human life? In the past century, we engaged in space exploration in an attempt to find other worlds similar to, to Earth. And will we try to also in the future genetically engineer humans who are designed to survive in other environments? And this is a very controversial topic, of course. If we cannot find another Earth, can we engineer people that can survive in the other planets instead? Well, this is why my ending phrase is, are we brave enough for the future we think we want? Can we handle the future we aspire? In this modern age of cynicism, many of us brindle in the face of such a proclamation. But elements of this transformation are already underway. So prosperity for all is actually within our grasp. Only if we don't just fight for what is needed for our personal well-being, but for what's possible for everyone, injecting a generous amount of transparency, of ethics, and compassion in this process. So what, what is the lessons, what, what is the take-home lesson from disruptive innovation? What, what, what do we get from it? Overall, no matter whether it is in medicine or in robotics or in renewable energy, well, I would say that we have to hope not for what's feasible, not for what is feasible today for us, but for, for what is possible, for what it might be needed in the future for everyone. Work not for the best that you think you can do, but for all that should be done. Here in Africa, in Asia, in Middle East. Fight, and I will have to insist on this, fight fight for the rights of the many over the privileges of the very few. And finally, because we're in the education forum, be what your education tells you you can be, the best. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We start open for questions. We have a couple of minutes. There will be a microphone. They can hear you. Very interesting talk, and we're really privileged to have you amongst our midst today. Um, it's absolutely mind-blowing. Now, just in context of this whole education uh, summit at the forum, um, and being a parent of two uh, girls, 13 and 12, um, what are your views in terms of exposure, current exposure, to students in school when you're talking about in 12 years' time, in 2030, just being out there on the horizon, and you seem to know of all the developments happening um, in the world, but what I can kind of imagine is there's only like a 1% of uh, student exposure or people who are privy to this kind of science. Um, what do you think should now start happening, because 12 years is just around the corner, uh, in terms of uh, exposing our students of the current now uh, in this kind of engineering field and in this kind of uh, disruptive innovation? Because I personally feel it's not happening enough. I would like to learn the views of others over here as well. 
I agree with you, first of all. Thank you for your question. I think it, it, everything starts with creating access. The primary field that disruptive innovation is happening is definitely information technology. It is the internet, the internet of things, and mobile apps. This is something that it is possible for us with the current technology to spread it around the globe. And if it weren't for a few mishaps last year, for example, where Zuckerberg tried to create satellites so that internet is spread over Africa, this would be already a, a, a reality. Um, absolutely, the, the, the most key message for students today is that no matter what type of innovations will happen, because this will also change in 10 years' time, there will be new fields, even more multidisciplinary. So multidisciplinarity is a very key element for how students are perceiving their, their educational path. And me, myself, I'm the most multidisciplinary person you can imagine. I started doing, I started with computer science, studied nanotechnology, regenerative medicine, bioengineering, so many different space medicine, so many different fields. Um, and then the second one is critical thinking. How can we help somebody understand how to think laterally, outside of the box? And it is something that it is not, it's easy, easier said than done, I think. There are a few ways to start create curiosity and, and, and create elements where the imagination is used. Um, and other than that, I think it's important to, to encourage kids to become adaptable. Even if they're coming from humble environments or if they're coming from a very wealthy area with everything in their uh, schools, I think they need to acknowledge what happens in the different side of the world. And personally, for me, that has changed me a lot. The, the fact that I, I was studying dish engineering, I was understanding the idea and why it's necessary to create artificial organs, but then going to Latin America and seeing victims of the illegal organ train, seeing why this is urgent. There is a sense of intense urgency of why we need to solve it. This completely changed me as well. So it's both worlds, both inspiring them, making them curious, pushing them to, to imagine, imagineering things, you know, both imagining and engineering, and also making them think inclusively. More questions? Or comments? Can, or, <laughs> or comments? Can I make mine? Yes, yes. Here? You have been all over the world uh, with this now and before. What are, you at the beginning mentioned some problems or challenges. How do you see the difference between the different continents or the different regions of the world or on this matter? Like you see. Mm. Well, I'm not going to comment on the economical facet. I will say this. Um, so, as you know, one of the a disruptive innovation is transportation with airplanes. And the Wright brothers in 1924, they were the first that they managed, they achieved, they succeeded in flying around the globe. Till then, Everybody thought, this is, they're crazy. It's, it's impossible. We cannot fly around the globe. It is such a, a big feat. We can't do it. But can you imagine if they were not men and they were women? And they were like, oh, you cannot work. You cannot pilot, definitely. So this may have not have happened. And today, many of us might be thinking that oh, it would be amazing. It would be a wonder if we could uh, uh, not, cross-navigate around the galaxy. And everybody thinks now, we can't do that, it's impossible. We don't have a spacecraft for that. But maybe we're close. It's just an exponential step away. So I would say the differences between the places that you asked me is, are we inviting everyone, both men and women, in the conversation? Are we inclusive enough? That's my message. OK. And one. Um, yes. yes, please. I want to ask about the ethics. What is ethical for you might not be ethical for me, different uh, in cultures. Mm -hmm. But also now there are no barriers, so no borders. So whatever you, let's say, uh, building in the US might not fit the culture here, but then use uh, 
transport everything around. How do we look at the global effects um, in innovations? Well, the scientific community is trying to create and has succeeded till this point, at least the medical, the scientific community, to have an international ethical uh, regulatory body. So most of the artificial organ, for example, experiments are equally hard to be approved, to be done, both in, in almost every part of the world. Definitely it's a major issue. You're ex very right about that. Mostly, not because we have the moral bias that everybody has. Everybody has a different compass, moral compass. It is exactly as you said. It's difficult to interpret what it means. So we have to create regulations for it, regulations for ethics. Um, however, I, I would say that protecting the boundaries of science so that progress can be done and also making sure that we are absolutely protecting the ethical component and the humane component of, of, of the work is equally important. So it's a very hard topic to deal, for sure. You're right. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, the talk. It's so great. Um, what I wanted to ask about is uh, safety. Because with all these disruptive innovations, they're so fast that we sometimes forget to test and make sure that it's uh, it's uh, safety long term. So not just for you know next five years, but over hundreds of years. So what do you think about that? This is the hardest topic in uh, at least medical innovation. In the, in other types of innovation, it is I think a more protected environment. But this is the reason why at least in medical science we have a one step of defense. We have the cases where it is for, uh, for example, there are cases where cancer patients, we know that they have a very limited uh, lifespan and it's a one-off experimental case. This is extremely hard to, to, to gain an ethical approval and rightfully so. Um, it is extremely difficult to create a pathway and a timeline so that we have checked every possible side effect. And that is because we can't imagine them. We don't know what they are. If we knew, like everybody would have a plan, but you are going against something that you don't know. So it is a, yeah, it's very difficult. Hello. <coughs> Thank you again for your talk, most interesting. Uh, my question also is really in, in terms of ethics, I think, um, like you, I can envisage you know, uh, space travel, space colonization happening very soon, if not in my lifetime, perhaps in my child's lifetime. Don't you think that um, if we don't, at the same time as we develop technology, we don't develop a shared sense of what it means to be in this world, we run the risk of spoiling completely this one and then moving on to spoil others? Yeah the best uh, final line, I think, for my talk. <laughs> uh, absolutely, yes. Um, we cannot invest billions on trying to fix problems here. And the only way out is colonizing Mars or creating uh, you know, a moon village, for example, which is another project that may happen in the next 10 years. Um, but the problem is, more humanitarian, more philosophical. Like, can we coexist? Has our history taught us any lessons or are we striving, understanding them? I don't think that science and technology should be blamed for that. Everything has two sides, you know, you can, it is a very common thing to say that you can take, you know, um, a knife and you can cut bread or you can kill someone. It's up to you, you know, <laughs> and this is, the, the, the most important thing, how do we preserve our humanity at the end so that the children have a moral compass instead of thinking that everything is superficial and they, they can just fix, have a quick fix with science and technology for everything.
I, I wanted to congratulate <laughs> for your talk. But I absolutely agree that the teachers are the cornerstone of our, of our yeah, society. We're going to create a split, and it's happening so quick. That split is, is amazingly detrimental to our society, which is the terrain of your development. Yeah. Even if you transport it to Mars, which I probably won't do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your comment, though. Thank OK, you. we are almost there. Last question for you to, to close this amazing session. What motivates you every day to, to continue growing on these many challenges that you have ahead? One personal comment to inspire us for the My future. Personal comment. Well, I think it's a, a, it's a battle every day. But I would say that there are small, it is very hard to accept a reality where you know that you're putting yourself in a job that every single day you will fail. And perhaps, maybe, one day in your life, you will succeed in something. Maybe one day. And if you make it that one day, everything, all the pain, all the disappointment before that will be justified. But I think that overall what motivates me is that even if you don't create a big discovery, but you are helping either people, either or creating a small contribution in a field so that the later generations will go back to the same problem. And because you have contributed, and, lay, and layer after layer and after layer of knowledge now, it's so much easier within somebody's lifetime to understand a problem so that it can be solved. For me, that is what is actually significant for every scientist to do and understand. That maybe I'm not gonna be that genius that's gonna solve a big problem, but my contributions might help somebody else make that click and that eureka moment. So I hope that you also, as teachers, help your students understanding that they're po it's possible for them to become that one person. It is just a matter of perseverance, of going every single day, even if every day you're getting disappointments in your job, continuing. Amazing, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the decision. Thank you.